Although they hadn't won a major tournament for over a decade, their fans were more than confident about their team's current good form and began celebrating a little prematurely. Since their World Cup victory two years before, both France and Zidane had continued to impress and they qualified for the finals of Euro 2000 with ease. The Dutch were favourites for the tournament, but the giant killing Les Bleus weren't too far away in the minds of fans and their competitors. Grouped in a similar format to the World Cup Finals, France found themselves in Group D, where they faced solid competition, including the Netherlands. France lost against the home side in their final group match, however they still made it through to the quarter-finals. Zidane was fit and on top form, and fans, teammates and coaches alike would have been happy to see their star player play up to his usual standard. However, Zidane wasn't about to rest on his laurels. Obsessed with improving, he trained tirelessly to hone his craft. At the time, Zizou's closest competition in the world's best player ratings was Ronaldo. In fact, the Brazilian's phenomenal goal-scoring ability often gave him the edge. However, Ronaldo had been out of action for some time after requiring knee surgery on a ruptured tendon. This left Zizou as the world's undisputed top player. Media, fans and opposing players wanted to learn more about the humble French midfielder and with all the attention came greater pressure. After a steady start to Euro 2000, Zidane, as he so often did, picked up the tempo for the quarter and semi-finals. In France's clash against Spain, Zidane scored his first goal for the tournament and then scored his second from a penalty late in extra time against a much improved Portugal to catapult France to yet another final. Despite scoring two crucial goals at critical stages of the tournament, some commentators and football journalists would persist in criticising him for the lack of goals to his name. Not only did they argue that a player of his calibre should be finding the back of the net more regularly, they also blamed him for Juventus's failure to win the championship. In his defence, however, many observers argued that Zidane's extraordinary talent lay in setting up goals for others, not scoring his own. In Euro 2000, he made more devastating slalom dribbles than Mark Overmars and more decisive crosses than Portugal's Luis Figo. His presence in the midfield not only generated chances from his own boots, but inspired those around him to follow his lead. France continued their impressive run, demonstrating a style of football so pleasing to the eye that even opposing fans could enjoy them. Having made it through to the final of Euro 2000, they prepared to meet Italy. With a more defensive game style than the French, the Italians would score often on the counter-attack. Throughout the whole tournament, the Italians had conceded only two goals, and if France were to break through their wall of resistance, it would be Zidane who would find their weak spot. Playing alongside many of the Italian national team members on a weekly basis at Juventus, Zidane, who had just turned 28, knew a lot more about the Italians' game style than most. It was the Italians he had to thank for his elite physical fitness and his calm and systematic approach to the big games. The clash against Italy to crown Europe's best in the final of Euro 2000 was not only a battle between two brilliant teams, it was a duel between pupil and master. The final, which, billed as the best climax to the best international tournament the world had seen, did not disappoint. After trailing 1-0 for almost 40 minutes, and with only one minute of injury time remaining, France scored an opportunist goal via Wiltord. The Italian fans, who had already popped the champagne, were forced to put their party on hold. Then, with 12 minutes gone in extra time, David Trezeguet scored one of the goals of the tournament to crown France as European champions. Once again, Zidane played a significant role in their victory. When the pressure needed to be increased after Italy scored in the 55th minute, it was Zidane who led the way. Zizou was once again the toast of the nation. His tournament equaled, if not bettered, his performance in the 1998 World Cup 
and the organisers of Euro 2000 agreed in naming him the player of the tournament. His manager, Roger Lemaire, could not have been happier with Zidane's form. But Lemaire was quick to point out that Zidane could still improve. During the tournament, he had said, there is so much more to come from Zidane. He can improve still further. He's phenomenal on his way to becoming a monument of French football, like Platini or Coppa. It wasn't only Le Maire who believed Zidane was destined for greatness. His talents were igniting the interest of the world's biggest clubs, and with his best years ahead of him, they would pay anything to see him in their colours. Florentino Perez, the Spanish businessman and ex-politician who went on to become president of Real Madrid, had a dream. He didn't dream of arranging global peace or of ending third world poverty. He dreamt of creating the best football team on the planet. Luckily for Perez, he had the means to make that dream come true. Thanks to him, Real Madrid was the richest soccer club in the world. In the summer of 2000, Perez used his impressive wealth to purchase one of the best playmakers around, Luis Figo. Figo was a Portuguese hero. His dazzling crosses equaled those of Zidane, and although his ball movements weren't quite as spectacular, Figo was undoubtedly one of the best players in the world. Not only was he a hero in his home country, he also was a much-loved player at FC Barcelona. The fierce rivalry between Real Madrid and FC Barcelona is legendary within the sport. So when Perez set his sights on signing the superstar, he had to make an offer that Barcelona could not refuse. Barca was offered a record-breaking £38.7 million to let go of Figo. Laughing all the way to the bank, Barcelona accepted the offer and Figo packed his bags for Real Madrid. Not surprisingly, the transfer did little to impress his former teammates, much less the passionate Barca fans. In fact, upon his return to FC Barcelona's home ground, Camp Nou, a study by a television station found that the noise of the crowd's whistles and jeers was louder than the sound of an aeroplane taking off. On his second appearance wearing Real Madrid colours at Camp Nou, Barcelona's ground almost had to be closed. All kinds of objects, including a pig's head, were thrown at Figo, who was also taunted with insults, such as pesetero, which means money whore. This did not deter the talented right winger, who went on to win the European Player of the Year in 2000, and then FIFA World Player of the Year in 2001. After reaping such rewards with his first expensive purchase, Florentino Perez decided it was time to go shopping again. This time, he was determined to come home with Zinedine Zidane. His form from Euro 2000 caught the attention of the Real Madrid president, and like a spoilt rich kid, what Perez wanted, Perez got, no matter what the cost. Juventus weren't willing to let Zidane go, and who could blame them? They had nurtured, moulded and developed Zidane into the world-beating player he had become. Owning the best player in the world was a privilege the Italian super club had earned, and now they were enjoying the benefits. Initially, the deal didn't seem likely to happen. Although Zidane was keen to move to Spain and test his skills in arguably the best league in the world, Juventus general manager Luciano Moggi insisted that Zidane had to stay until his contract had expired in 2005. However, with the exception of Zidane, the current Juventus squad was starting to get a little stale. The 25-time league champions had finished second in consecutive years and management started to concede that transferring Zidane for a huge fee would give them the opportunity to buy new talent that could pave the way for a 26th league title. After many hours of negotiation, Perez finally got his way and Zidane was moving to Spain. This purchase didn't come cheap, and it would be fair to say that it would have left a hefty hole in any wallet, even one the size of Real 